Welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry and social justice. Hello, this is James and welcome to the podcast. And our sponsor this week is the JAEC Foundation, which is hosting an international conference on open dialogue this August. And you can visit the website jaecfoundation.org for more information. And now on to our interview. And this week we hear from the co-authors of a paper published in Ethical Human Psychology and Psychiatry, which documents the mass murder of a quarter of a million people who were mostly diagnosed as schizophrenic in Europe during the Second World War and the sterilization of hundreds of thousands more. Later in the podcast, we'll hear from Dr. Jeffrey Masson, who is an author and a scholar of Sanskrit and psychoanalysis. But first, I got to spend time talking with Professor of Psychology John Reed. Those of you familiar with Madden America will know of John's work. For those that don't know, John worked for nearly 20 years as a clinical psychologist and manager of mental health services in the UK and USA before joining the University of Auckland, New Zealand in 1994. He has served as Director of the Clinical Psychology Professional Graduate Programs at both Auckland and more recently the University of Liverpool, and he currently works in the School of Psychology at the University of East London. John has many research interests, including critical appraisals of the use of psychiatric drugs and electroconvulsive therapy. We discussed how John and Jeffrey came to write a paper which examines a grim period in psychiatric history. John, welcome. Thank you so much for Joining me again for the Madden America podcast, it's a, a pleasure to be with you. And we're going to talk a little bit about a, a paper that's to be published in the journal Ethical Human Psychology and Psychiatry, and it's entitled Biological Psychiatry and the Mass Murder of Schizophrenics from Denial to Inspirational Alternative. And you wrote this paper with a, a co-author of yours, Jeffrey Masson, who we'll also hear from a, bit, a, a little bit later. So. In overall terms, the article documents the murder by psychiatrists of a quarter of a million patients, mostly diagnosed as schizophrenic in Europe during the Second World War, and the sterilization of hundreds of thousands more internationally, including in the USA and Scandinavia. And, you know, it's a fascinating paper. It's quite difficult to read, of course, because of the content, but it is fascinating too. So uh, when I was reading it, I guess the first question that came to mind was really how did this paper come to be written and how did you and Jeffrey contribute to it? Right. Thanks. Thanks, James. Nice to be with you again. Well, I guess the first thing to acknowledge is that uh, Jeffrey, Jeff, Jeffrey Masson is a, um, I would describe him really as a Holocaust scholar. He, I mean, he knows far, far more about the Holocaust, including this particular part of it, psychiatry's role, than I do. And he happened to be living in New Zealand. We happened to become good friends. And the current article is an update of a book chapter we wrote together back in 2013, when uh, you know, s sitting with Jeffrey, hearing more and more about a lot of stuff that I hadn't heard of, and I, you know, reasonably well read about psychiatry and the history of psychiatry, um, but I didn't know half of what he was telling me, and I thought this has to get this has to get out there somehow. So we did write the book chapter about it, um, but as you know, book chapters you know are not particularly well read, so I wanted to try and get it out in in a more accessible form, a more up, more up to date form. So that hence the um, hence this article, and I think it's fairly timely in as much as that it does begin. It is beginning to feel like the monolithic medical model promoted by the drug companies and biological psychiatry really is now finally beginning to crumble. I mean, we've got the World Health Organization writing long reports about it. We've got the United Nations Special Rapporteur completely condemning the overemphasis on, on biology um, and compulsion and so forth. And and just this week, um, astonishing and I think historic paper by Joanna Moncrief, Mark Horowitz and others documenting that there absolutely is no evidence for the chemical imbalance um, behind depression uh, on the basis of which millions and millions of antidepressants have been prescribed for the last 20 or 30 years, which I know is a, an issue close to your heart, James. I, so things are, are changing, and the task for us all is to accelerate that change. So I think it's useful to remind people of the 
of the extremes, and it is an extreme, obviously, uh, uh, to which you know, a biological explanation for human distress can take us if we're not careful. And I will talk later about some of the ways in which uh, there are parallels to what happened all those years ago and what's happening today, including the continuing use of, of force and, and, and compulsion. And just how strong the genetic theories are still today dominating our, our thinking and our, our mental health services. So that's the, that's the motivation for it. But it was also important, I think, and we'll come on to this, to, to put in an alternative rather than to leave everybody just with doom and gloom and, and so forth. Uh, an alternative also run by psychiatrists. Um, the alternative is, as we'll see, is about how, um, people returning to Israel were, were treated uh, by the Israeli psychiatric system. Thank you, John. So b- before we talk a little bit about the contents of the paper and, and, you know, what you found when you wrote it, I just wondered what your thoughts were on why do we need to know about the past history of psychiatry? You know, is it relevant to today? Well, you know, it's a cliche, isn't it? But we, we, we should learn from history and not make the same mistakes and i'm not for a second saying that psychiatrists are killing people today in the same way that they um were actively i think murder is the right word i mean they used the word euthanasia and um getting rid of life devoid of value and so forth but it was murder uh, i'm not saying people are doing that today but people are still dying in the psychiatric system there are there are parallels um a unevidenced uh, genetic i would say ideology um, is still quite dominant, and the effects of that are, are manifold. And apart from anything else, it creates this pessimism. You know, there's something wrong with your genes. What on earth is the point of trying to improve your life or do anything different? You know, it, the message is that you are flawed, as with the chemical imbalance theory, which we've fortunately now dis- disproved. Um, and there isn't really any evidence for the, the genetic basis to certainly to schizophrenia or, or, for that matter, depression or any anything else in the psychiatric repertoire. So I think it's important to um, to, to link these things up and to see that there's a, a long tradition, and this goes back hundreds of years, not um, a, a long tradition of harming people who are different in the name of helping them. In the name of doing something good for them, and and even even those horrific murders were framed as helping people um, rid themselves of life devoid of value. It was framed as it's good for them and and for society because they're a drain on on society. Just as it was considered good to uh, valuable to uh, for the witches to be burnt because that redeemed their souls. There, there's all and they could go to heaven. So th- there's always there's always been within attempts to help people who are different there's always been historically a streak of uh harm and violence and undervaluing those people's lives which somehow then allows or justifies the the harm and i think some of that is still going on today so turning to the paper then i wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the content and you know some of the things that you found and you know perhaps some of the things that surprised you when you were working on this with jeff well, I guess what surprised me with it was the sheer size of 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 the deaths. And I, I also, I also, I mean, as you said at the beginning, a quarter of quarter of a million people were killed uh, in Europe by by psychiatrists um, and their assistants, obviously in in psychiatric hospitals. Um, it started off with children. I didn't know that. Um, relatively small numbers, but that's that's where it started with starving and other methods to kill. About initially about ten thousand children, and then in nineteen thirty eight they moved on to to adults, and it was um, in part the size, but also the the rationale for it was is, that was kind of important, I think, because the the the, the eugenics was obviously a, a wide movement way beyond psychiatry, of course, uh, and some psychologists, some very famous psychologists were involved in the eugenics movement, including Burt and Spearman and Cattell and other huge names in psychology. So it's not unique to psychiatry, but um, but psychiatry had the power, if you like, to act on it. And, and the rationale started in some ways in a, in a, in a, uh, a book in 1920 written by Ernst Rudin, a professor of psychiatry, 
uh, about life devoid of value and introducing legislation into Germany that made it possible to sterilize people. This was a precursor to the, to the killings. And again, that was not unique to Germany. Um, the first sterilization law, in fact, was in uh, Indiana. Um, and by the time of the Second World War, there were 20 states in the, in, in the United States with um, sterilization laws. Scandinavia was also uh, quite a leading area in terms of compulsory sterilizations. Uh, off, not always, but often of for insanity, um, often targeted more at women than men. Uh, eugenics was a wide movement, um, and sterilization was the first um, example of it, targeted not just at mentally ill people, so-called, but people with any sort of deformity, disability, or, or, or whatever. And the, 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 the linking rationale was that these people had genetic problems. And so it was an attempt, to, as, you, as we all know what eugenics means, it's an attempt to purify the race. With good intent, um, we have to assume most of the time, until we get to Nazi Germany, of course. So um, it, was, it was an attempt to get rid of these disabilities and illnesses. Um, alcoholism was in there as well. That was considered to be genetic, and we can get rid of it if we can sterilize um, alcoholics and so forth. Moving on to the, to the murders, from 1938 onwards, the murders started, and there was um, six psychiatric hospitals throughout Germany, and by the end uh, of the war, about, as you said, about a quarter of a million people had been killed. Most of the people with a diagnosis of schizophrenia had been killed by the end of the war. And one of, one of the lessons, this is never spoken about, Jane, one of the lessons is that this was the, uh, it's a grotesque, but it is the, perhaps certainly the largest experiment that tests whether or not schizophrenia is a genetically based phenomenon because they literally kill the vast majority so if it was a genetically based phenomenon then in the next generation there'd be very very low numbers if, if if any but the numbers didn't change at all which shows that schizophrenia like all other mental health problems are almost entirely psychosocially based and nothing to do with genetics uh, but nobody talking about that. That genetic theory just carries on um, regardless. So, um, yeah, I mean, we, there's lots of details in, in the paper. I don't think it's worth um, going through through all of them. But the, the extent to which the psychiatrists were involved is important. The chairs of 10 psychiatry departments, professors at 10 psychiatry departments, uh, were in charge of selecting who died. So it wasn't some sort of peripheral uh, in, in involvement. They were central to it. They planned it. They decided who died. And in many cases, they actually carried out the, the, the killings themselves. So obviously, with those numbers, they obviously had assistance. The other thing I, I didn't know, or one of the many things I didn't know, was that when it came time to start the killing of six million Jews, the, the instruments that had been used in the psychiatric hospital, and the psychiatrists themselves were then shipped to Treblinka and other places. One of them became a commandant of, of one of one of the, the Holocaust camps. So the rationale and the tools and the personnel for the Holocaust came from psychiatry. And obviously, psychiatrists today are not responsible for any of that. But they ought to talk about it now and again. They ought to acknowledge it. They ought to realize that there are risks involved in having simplistic, unsubstantiated views of where human distress and differences come from um, and learn from that. And they haven't. It's really troubling, isn't it? You know, in the paper, it says that about half of German physicians belong to the Nazi party, with psychiatrists being the most heavily involved. But Amazingly, only a handful of psychiatrists refused to participate in the killings. Yes, and I, I mean, we, if we were back there at the time, I, I, I suppose we, we can't really grasp the extent of the social pressure and the peer, the peer pressure, and maybe even threats um, if they didn't comply. But uh, the history books tell us that only, only one psychiatrist was ever executed for refusing. So few, some, but some did refuse. Um, and we document that, and we name of the very small number 
of people who refuse to cooperate and to note their their bravery. And it probably was a brave, brave thing to do. So it's easy to condemn from from this point in history looking looking back. But when you know, it's like when all your other fellow doctors are doing the same thing. The pressure to comply is huge. That's not an excuse. That's an ex- that's a possible partial explanation, I suppose. So. How has psychiatry responded since? You know, the, these things are obviously a matter of public record, and you know, you were able to find the details along with Jeff of, of what had happened. So, what has psychiatry's reaction been since those awful occurrences? Well, for many, many years, there was virtual total denial. That's exemplified by history books throughout the sixties and seventies, saying and eighties, saying nothing about it. We found one had a, a chapter on every, country, I don't know, 30 countries or whatever, uh, the World History of Psychiatry by Howell, I can, I can remember it. And every chapter went up to 19, I forget exactly, probably 1980 something. But the history of Germany stopped at 1939. It just stopped. Nothing happened. Um, and there's example, example after example. In, a, in the modern history books of psychiatry, there's either no mention of it at all, or even worse, there's mention of some of the um, professors involved and, and their research as the forefathers of, of psychiatric genetics, um, which they were, uh, but with no mention of their involvement in these killings, which is um, bizarre. I mean, in, in Germany, the first of the first 12 presidents of the German Psychiatric Association after the war, three of them were centrally involved in, in the killings. Uh, many of the psychiatrists just carried on working. Um, very little censure. Um, one of, one of the leading, um, architects was fined 500 marks. The, one of the leading people, Franz Kalman, went over to America and wrote for two decades about the genetic basis to schizophrenia and homosexuality. He advocated that not only schizophrenics should be compulsively sterilized, but all their relatives should be compulsively sterilized. Uh, and this was readily um, published in scientific journals in America and around the world. I, I could go on, I won't, but there's this massive denial, and um, which has to some extent gone on to this to this day. As I say, you can still read psychiatric textbooks that either have nothing about psychiatric history books, nothing about this, or, or citing the um, architects as, as important contributors to our understanding of schizophrenia. Obviously, there has been some writing in the meantime, mostly not from psychiatrists. One or two eventually have written about it, but mostly it was other people that wrote about it and, and, and documented it. I mean, we have a journal called The History of Psychiatry, which hardly publishes anything on this topic. It declined our paper because it doesn't fit with the remit of the, of the, of the journal. And, and because it was explained to me in the, when the paper was rejected, that biological psychiatry didn't start until the 1980s. Uh, I, I don't know what to say about that. So it's fairly universal denial, um, understandable. I mean, it's, it's hugely, I don't know what the right word is, embarrassing, shameful. None of us like to talk about shameful things in our past. And again, I'm stress this is not about uh, holding current psychiatrists to account. It's not their fault. Um, but... The leaders of psychiatry should um, be teaching their students about how things can go wrong if you place too much emphasis on uh, wrong theories. Uh, and John, um, you know, the, the paper is fascinating and, and challenging to read and all the rest of it, but perhaps the most important bit is you talking about um, what you call an inspirational alternative um, so I wondered if you could, you know, share with us what that inspirational alternative was. Yes, I, I found this fascinating. Completely by chance, I stumbled into this. There was a a film film made about what happened um, to Holocaust survivors when they got back to Israel, uh, or to a certain um, group of them. Hun- hundreds of Holocaust survivors who got back to Israel were diagnosed. Uh, obviously, they were in a terrible, terrible state, many of them, and they were wrongly diagnosed as having schizophrenia and locked up and medicated heavily with antipsychotics for 40 or 50 years, which is not an inspirational alternative. And what comes next is the inspirational alternative. But then there's this wonderful event, which you couldn't make up, so that one of these women, 
um, is about to be visited by her son. But she's terrified because she's, she's convinced herself in her delusional state that her son is an SS officer and she hides. And it turns out that the son is Israel's chief psychiatrist visiting his mum. And he finally gets it. He, 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 the, the, he understands and then starts talking to the other women and finding out there's hundreds of people whose pain and confusion and, and silence, because many of them hadn't spoken for for years, was explicable by their experience in the camps and the ghettos, not by some mythical biological illness called schizophrenia. And and what he did with, with fellow psychiatrists, and it's very important to stress this was led by psychiatrists, they um, closed down, it took them two or three years, but they closed down several institutions where hundreds of these women, mostly women, were. A lot of the men had died, so they were mostly women, and opened trauma-based um, treatment centres and tried 40, 50 years later to, to reach these people, who, as I say, many of whom hadn't spoken for decades. And they tried, it was, it was quite beautiful. They, they started by getting them animals that reminded them the same as the pets they'd had when they were children, and so forth. Uh, so it's, a very, it's a very moving story. And, and they write about how, how moving it was for, for the staff and how much they learned, as, as you can imagine. So it's just, it's, I know these are extreme examples on either end of the spectrum, but it seemed important to highlight that there are, there are other ways of, for psychiatrists and other people in the mental health system to, to try and assist even the most distressed and damaged people. And it starts by understanding what they've been through in their lives, rather than blaming um, a non-existent genetic factor or some sort of imagined biochemical imbalance. So I was quite, we were quite moved by that. And I, I was lucky enough to have some interactions with those psychiatrists, and one of whom has since, since died. I was just very moved by that. And it just seemed fair and appropriate to include that in, in the story. Yeah, absolutely. It describes in the paper that they, they videotaped some of the people who are involved they videotape their testimonials and when those people watch the testimonials back they didn't recognize themselves did they because they isolated themselves from their experiences to such a great extent they almost thought it was a different person that's right yes yes so can you imagine sitting there with somebody watching that and that person in, in that it was they did it partly to archive and, and record but also they thought it would be therapeutic and i think eventually they did start recognizing themselves but it's um it was, it was astonishing what they did and they did it's a bit in a way it seems a bit trite but they did do some traditional type research where they measured post-traumatic stress symptoms and so forth and they decreased gradually o o over time so yeah i think yeah it's just a very move i mean it's all very moving uh, some of it desperately sad and some of it very inspiring and i, I think really that that comes back to what you were talking about uh, talking about earlier in terms of why this is important, even though it's past history, why this is so important to research, to set out, and to understand in terms of its impact on what we do to people today. Yes, and obviously we're not doing anything like that, except, I mean, we are, we are uh, in America in particular, I, I don't know about other countries, not, not here, but in America they're still practicing what they call genetic counselling. Which is where, where you get in people of childbearing age or, or a couple or whatever, one of whom might have a diagnosis of schizophrenia. And you explain to them the chances of their children inheriting this supposed illness that they've got. Um, and presumably in the, in the hope that some will choose not to, not to get, not to go ahead. Um, which I think is scurrilous and unethical, certainly unscientific. And if there, if there is a genetic basis to any of this, and I, I don't think there's a genetic basis to schizophrenia, but I do think we are born with uh, different degrees of sensitivity to stress. I think at the end of the day, when all this genetic research settles down, that's what we will find. So there's, we're still, in, in that sense, narrowing the gene pool, um, or at least in, in, in the States. And I think it's a very dangerous thing to do. Um, it, beyond that, what are, what are the other parallels? Well, we still have compulsion. It is the only branch of medicine where you can force people 
to either take medication or have electroshock therapy against their will. So that's a, that's a con continuity. Of course, it's not the same as killing people. But again, in terms of the narrowing the gene pool or or whatever, these uh, some of the drugs, both antidepressants and antipsychotics, um, clearly affect sexual dysfunction. Antipsychotics, uh, if you take them long enough, will shorten your lifespan. And ECT causes uh, brain damage in somewhere, we don't know exactly, somewhere between 10 and 50% of people. So we are still doing things that are harmful and doing it very often with compulsion. Um, and yes, that's different from actively killing people or forcibly sterilizing them. But there, there is a there is a link there, uh, and I firmly believe that we will never have therapeutic mental health systems until we remove the right of any of us to forcibly treat anybody else. While that threat is there, um, it's very hard for people to trust to trust the system when you can be given shock therapy or medication that shortens lifespan and, and reduces brain volume, etc., against your will. Um, so I know this would be offensive to some psychiatrists or other people, and I'm sorry for that, but um, I think there will be a time in 50 years' time when someone will write a paper about, do you know they used to put electricity through people's brains and they used to do it against their will? Can you imagine? And they used to give them pills. If they didn't take the pills, they'd hold them down and inject them into them against the can you imagine in 50 years time I, I i hope you and i won't be around james but i hope there'll be a, a james interviewing a john uh about about that in 50 years time because it's got to stop yeah absolutely uh, and so john you know you said that there was no recognition really at the time or just after the time of what had happened so in modern times has psychiatry officially responded to and apologized for the horrors vested on people in the name of treatment in those very dark times uh, the answer is yes um only in germany um and obviously that is the first place it, uh, the appropriate place it should happen in 2011 the the german Association of Neurology and Psychiatry, which, as I, which I referred to before as having been led on numerous occasions by the people directly responsible, um, had a, a, a full investigation. Um, and we end the, we end the paper uh, with a, a, a quote from Professor Schneider, who is the current, was at that point, the current president of that association. Um, and it's a superb document, um, very detailed, pulls no punches, and it ends with, in the name of the German Association, I'm reading his words now, for psychiatry and psychotherapy, which is what it's called now, I ask you, the victims and relatives of the victims, for forgiveness for the pain and injustice you suffered in the name of German psychiatry and at the hands of German psychiatrists under National Socialism. And, and this was the bit that was particularly important, and for the silence, trivialization, and denial that for far too long characterized psychiatry in post-war Germany. Um, the rest of the world hasn't got there yet, I don't think, in acknowledging this. And I hope our paper play, plays some small part in um, moving, moving us towards proper acknowledgement and learning from those horrible events and from accelerating the move towards a evidence-based psychosocial humane uh, approach to, to human distress that is long overdue. Yeah, as I said, it was really difficult to read in the paper. Mass murder described as pioneering work. You know, that's very hard to take. Yes, I guess that, that's how they saw it at the time. Look, looking back, did they did they really think they were doing it for the? I, I we we will we will never be able to get inside the heads of those those people their, their writing suggests that it, they really thought these people's lives were so miserable they were better off dead um what they really thought we, we will never know john thank you thank you for your time today and thank you for your work with jeffrey on writing the paper you know I, I think it is incredibly important that we don't lose sight of the consequences of harm in treatment and how we have to be ultra cautious with anything to do with mental health and its impact on people's lives so uh, it, it is a challenging paper to read but it's a very important contribution to 
the history that we we need to have with a hope to improve things for people for the future. Thanks, James, and thanks for having me. Next, we hear from Jeffrey Masson. Dr. Masson has had a fascinating career in which he studied Sanskrit and psychoanalysis and became director of the Sigmund Freud Archives. A prolific author, he has written more than 30 books and has become an advocate for animal rights. He is currently an honorary fellow in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. Um, Dr. Masson, Jeff, um, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today. Pleasure to be here, James. Thank you. Um, and we're here to talk about a paper that you authored together with um, Professor of Psychology, Dr. John Reed. And it, this paper appears in the journal Ethical Human Psychology and Psychiatry. So the title of the paper is Biological Psychiatry and the Mass Murder of Schizophrenics from Denial to Inspirational Alternative. And we'll, we'll come on in a minute, if that's okay, to talk about the paper. But first, I wanted to ask a little bit about you. So you're an author. Um, you have at least 20 books, probably many more to your name. You're a Sanskrit scholar. Uh, you're a scholar of psychotherapy, and, and you have an interest in the philosophy of animal rights. But I, I read somewhere that you said you'd written a series of books about psychiatry and you felt that nobody liked them. So, you know, I'd like to ask about that and why you decided to move away from that area of work and then what led to your other many interests. Sure. Well, it's a complicated story and I won't, I won't go into any detail because it's far from our topic. But in fact, I was trained as a classical Freudian psychoanalyst in Toronto for 10 years which means that I had my own analysis, and then I had supervision, then I saw patients, and finally I was admitted uh, as a fully trained clinical psychoanalyst. And I had doubts about it right from day one, <laughs> mostly having to do with, um, I suppose, really mostly having to do with trauma. I expected that psychoanalysis really was, how do we explain trauma? How do we help people who have been traumatized? What are our theories about how that works and so on? And that turned out not to be the case at all. I realize now in retrospect, it was really all about this notion that uh, patients don't know what's happened to them, only the psychiatrist does. And that today, then forever will seem to me absurd. The only person who really knows is the person. And so in my opinion, the job of the analyst is to say, well, it sounds to me like you've had a rough childhood or things have happened to you. And can we talk about that? Uh, but that's not what they were doing. So they were not respecting the patient, um, even though these were people who were either psychoanalysts already or becoming psychoanalysts, they still really identified with psychiatry, which meant they thought of people having brain disorders, have genetic malfunctions, needing medication, um, needing, God help us, ECT. I can still remember when they sent me to a psychiatric hospital to observe the results of ECT. And there was a poor Uruguayan who I, and I happened to have lived in Uruguay and I spoke perfect Spanish and I started talking to him and he said, please, please tell them not to do that, I'm terrified. And I said, I, I will do my best. And I went to them and I said, you can't do this. This guy doesn't want it. How can you do something he doesn't want? He said, well, this is for his own good. I said, oh, come on. You know, you have a man saying, don't do this to me. Don't do it. It's simple as that. And they said, you know, you're only here to observe. Why don't you just shut up? I never went back. And I thought, this is not for me. And that made me, I mean, I started questioning. I think within the first year was a 10-year training. I have to say it was a a waste of 10 years, in a sense. On the other hand, I learned what I don't like. <laughs> and I got some books out of it. I, I must have written, you know, I've written about 31 books altogether, but about 10 of them had to do with what's wrong with psychiatry, psychoanalysis, psychology, Jung. Um, I really learned to hate it. I mean, that's the truth. Uh, I, I'm not uh, indifferent about psychiatry. I'm not willing to hear the other side. I've already heard the other side. I really don't like it. I got very radicalized in my own mind. First of all, I had quite a bit to do 
after I became an analyst with the anti-psychiatry movement, the patients' rights movement. And I was very impressed. I still am. It's not as much of a force in America as it used to be. I think simply because psychiatry has so much money and uh, they're so obnoxious, they just won't listen to them. And in all my 10 years of training, not once did we bring in a real person who had undergone any of this to hear their criticism, which made me very unhappy and very nervous. I mean, wait a minute, you've got these thousands, literally thousands of people who say, this harmed me, why aren't you willing to listen to them? So, and I carry this further, I guess, than my, my wonderful friend, I would call him in many ways my best friend, John Reed, because um, we were together for many years in, in New Zealand. The only thing we disagree about is therapy. So I came away very um, skeptical of all therapy. And I guess that made me a real outlier, uh, even within the patients' rights movement. And I wrote a book called Against Therapy. Therapy, it seemed to me, was just too close to psychiatry. Even feminist therapy, even so-called radical therapy like R.D. Lang. And, I mean, Lang remained a psychiatrist his whole life. You know, on the one hand, I think it's perfectly legitimate for anybody who suffered, anybody, whether from depression, you know, I'd rather call it sadness, I mean, serious sadness, people who have serious sadness, they have every right to seek whatever help they can get. So if they want to go to see a therapist, I'm not going to tell them not to, but I would tell them, be careful, because many therapists are going to say, well, this is just a brain disease, and we've got to put you on medication, and things will get worse. Or, you know, or now behavioral therapy is going to tell them, you're just looking at the world in the wrong way. If only you looked at it the way I look at it, you wouldn't be depressed. Well, they don't know what they're talking about, you know, <laughs> and they have no right. They have no right to say that to anybody. So I, I, I mean, I guess somebody like John Reed, who really is a sh humane and decent human being, if he were your therapist, he would not do any harm. I'm sure of that, 100% sure. And I'm sure there are others, but very few and far between. And how do you identify them? How do you know in advance? You go and see somebody because they're listed in a phone book or a friend tells you, they don't say much and slowly you learn, I don't know, they're into Brexit or they're into some sort of denial of child abuse or they hate Ford. God knows what their problems are. And which only means it can be very hard for them to understand you, certainly me. So I, I just wouldn't trust anybody. And now, where does that leave people who need help? I don't know. I'm not claiming that I have a solution. I'm just saying that what we're offered is not great, and it's not reliable, and it's not entirely human. It's not like a friend talking. So, so Jeff, so you obviously have a, a connection with John Reed there, but how was it that the two of you came to decide to write this paper on the, the kind of historic horrors perpetrated on the so-called mentally ill in the, the Second World War years? So I first became interested in the Holocaust um, really as a teenager. I'm Jewish. So, um, and it was one of the few topics that absolutely fascinated me, just I couldn't read enough. And um, I remember seeing the film, uh, the, the famous French film, Sorrow and the Pity. And then, of course, I read Hannah Arendt's The um, Eichmann in Jerusalem, which I absolutely hated. And I was married to a woman who was a survivor of the Holocaust. She was born in 1937, and she was born in Warsaw. She was Jewish, and she was in the Warsaw Ghetto. And so, of course, we talked a lot about trauma and what it does to you. And she and I together went to visit Honor Freud long before I had anything to do with the Freud archive. I was just beginning my analytic training. And she kind of reluctantly agreed to see me and my wife. And I know that Honor Freud had been hauled in by the Gestapo in 1938, and it was one of the reasons that Freud agreed to leave Vienna. Nobody knows what happened to her that afternoon. It must have been ghastly. 
And my wife at the time also had ghastly experiences, of course, with Germans. And I thought the two would bond. They did not. We quite openly said we're here because of my wife's past and my interest in the Holocaust. And our question to you is why is it that analysts, psychoanalysts, have not paid more attention to the Second World War and to the trauma that people went through? I can't remember reading anything profound about that at that time. So this is 1974 or so. And there was nothing. And I expected her to say, yes, that's terrible. I totally agree with you. And she did not. She said, well, that's reality. And analysts are interested in fantasy. I said, well, you know, nobody went through the Holocaust with fantasies. They went through it in reality. She just, just tossed it aside. And that really bothered me. I thought, my God, maybe I'm in the wrong profession. And I really did believe for a long time that the purpose of analysis was to uncover buried memories and to make those memories tolerable, to bring them to consciousness, to think about them, and then to think about what could result. Now, if that were all that therapists did, I would have no problem with it. But of course they don't. You know, my wife at the time was in analysis with a man whose name to me sounded very German. She assumed he was Jewish. Turned out he was of German ancestry. Uh, in fact, he had something to do with the um, Hitler Jugend. He was not at all sympathetic to what she was telling him. And she just had no clue. And when I became a candidate, I, of course, began to know him. And I told her and she quit. But it, it, it for me, was kind of the model of how any patient or any client, whatever you want to call them, anybody who's in some sort of therapy or analysis or psychiatric treatment just has no clue who they're dealing with. And so it, it's very dangerous, in my opinion. Uh, and I think people do get hurt. Of course, there are people who say, I was helped, and who am I to say they weren't? But um, I do know many, many people have been harmed by psychiatry, thousands, literally. Uh, I think there are a lot of people who have been harmed by analysis, and there are many people harmed by therapy. And that is my interest, those who are harmed. I understand. I, I, I guess, you know, going back to the paper, you know, in, in terms of harm, there is no greater harm than the, the murdering of a quarter of a million people. The paper, um, it, it is a really challenging read. It's fascinating, of course, as a historical document, but it, it's a challenging read in terms of knowing that humans can do that to each other. And I wondered what you felt as you were kind of doing the research for it and writing it. Well, I, I yeah, that's a good question, James. I actually felt very bad. Um, <laughs> And I, John and I were originally going to write a book on psychiatry and the Holocaust. And I did a lot of research, um, which meant spending time in Germany, spending time in concentration camps, archives, um, libraries. Um, you know, there are probably 100,000 books written now about the Holocaust. So and it's a huge field. And... Um, Psychiatry in the Holocaust, much less, but there's a lot written, especially in German. And as I read it, I just got very, very depressed. <laughs> it was such awful stuff. Um, as you say, how can humans do this to other humans? It often made me cry. And, and then I married a German woman, <laughs> much younger than myself. So <clears throat> she didn't, had, hadn't been through any of this and was very, of course, sympathetic. Uh, but I could see that it was really having a bad impact on her. I'd come home and having read these horrible stories about children. She didn't want to hear about children being starved to death or killed. She just didn't want to hear it. And as a German, it was very hard for her to hear that. And I thought if I write this book and spend the next four to five years researching this and come home every day with horror stories, it's going to affect my marriage <laughs> and her mental health and my mental health. So in the end, I feel that I've kind of said that the main things that needed to be said in that paper. And uh, I also feel 
that John was able to take out something positive from it. I could not. So when I was in Israel, I met a number of Jewish psychiatrists, Israeli Jewish psychiatrists, and I assumed they would be on my side. They were not. So this is in the 80s. And they, were, they had been trained in Germany, and they remained German psychiatrists. So they had no critique, but I did not find that they had any greater sympathy or any greater understanding of trauma than anyone else. So that was very disappointing to me. But things are starting to change, as John found out. And that's amazing. That story he tells in there, which is his story, about the, the woman who was a Holocaust survivor and whose son was chief of psychiatry and finally realized that all her problems stem from not talking about what had happened to her. And I, that, I believe that absolutely thoroughly. I believe it for every major so-called mental illness. I think people who are deeply depressed have things they either can't remember or can't talk about or do not have somebody sympathetic enough to listen. Any child who's been beaten as a child or abused as a child is a survivor. And they're very similar to Holocaust survivors. So that her son was able to shift his whole thinking and then to shift the hospital into recognizing that is a real achievement. And I agree with John, it does give you hope. Now, I would want to follow up and see how many other hospitals in Israel are doing that. And, you know, can a whole culture change itself? Well, maybe. But um, that was not my focus. My focus was on what happened. And that's not a pretty topic. You know, it was so difficult to read, not only that these things happen, but I mean, how many uh, psychiatrists in Germany were members of the Nazi party and then how few doctors or psychiatrists actually spoke out about, about the horrors. I think it said in the paper that one was actually executed, but very, very few actually spoke out at all about these horrors, did they? Or faced any consequences. And, you know, um, there was there is a book that's received a lot of good press by Robert J. Lifton. Uh, called The Nazi Doctors, and I just abhor that book. I cannot bear to read it. I did read it carefully. It's so wrong. It's so off. And the reason is, I, I, I'll just tell you one quick anecdote that will illustrate what's wrong with that kind of book. He's a psychiatrist, Robert Lifton. He's still around. He did some very good work on Hiroshima early on that was wonderful. But he he has this, I think, quite idiotic explanation for why German psychiatrists did what they did. He calls it doubling. So on the one hand, they would have a double personality. They'd go in and they'd kill patients and then they'd come home, they'd be a great father. I don't believe that. I really don't believe it. And to illustrate this, he talks about a Jewish psychiatrist in Auschwitz who became friends with an Auschwitz doctor in Auschwitz because they both wanted to experiment with ECT on patients. And he, Robert Lifton, said, this is, you know, this is wonderful. Just shows you that we can cross the barrier. And this is so wrong on so many levels that they would bond over torturing patients. So as you can see, it was a hard article for me to write. But because I was doing it with John Reed, who is the picture of absolute integrity, kindness, empathy, and super smart, <laughs> I was glad to do it. And, you know, I know German, he doesn't, so I was able to bring some things to it that he couldn't. Um, and he, is a more, he has a more cheerful view of humanity than I do, and was able to find the bright side of the change that's happening. So uh, I, I'm really proud of that article. I'm very happy. I'm, I'm so glad that it's there, that it's in the public domain. It seems to be getting attention. Yeah, it, it is incredibly powerful. And Jeff, I, I wondered, so, you know, it, it's incredibly important to recount these past horrors, but I wondered if you felt that this past history has a bearing on how we treat people diagnosed as mentally ill in modern times today. Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, I've been away from the field of psychiatry and psychoanalysis and psychology for so long, 
that whenever I do talk to people, they, uh, professionals, they say, well, you know, it was very bad in your days, but it's changed. I don't think it has. Um, and of course, I read everything that John Reed writes, and I can see from his writings, things have not changed at all, that uh, ECT is still being used in America, I think everywhere in the world, probably. Um, drugs are more popular than ever. I don't have the expertise to pronounce on it, but I don't like psychiatric drugs at all. I think they do a huge amount of harm. By and large, I don't think psychiatry has changed very much. Now, I, I think what surprises me, and I guess it surprises John too, is how many psychiatrists around the world are interested in the history of psychiatry in the Third Reich. And not only in the Third Reich, as John pointed out, America was doing horrible things, um, even Sweden. Uh, I was very pleased to see, I think John found this, um, the head of the German Psychiatric Society apologized, Schneider. Uh, I don't know if he was speaking for himself or for the whole society, but I thought that was wonderful. And uh, I'm right now talking to you from Berlin, and Berlin is very definitely a different place <laughs> than it was um, many years ago, of course. And um, it is nice to see that in some respects, people are moving in the right direction. I think the very fact that people feel so strongly about Ukraine is a good sign. I remember when it was considered a miracle that um, Angela Merkel allowed a, a one million Syrian refugees to come into Germany. But it turns out it was a very good thing for everybody. It really helped the economy. <laughs> it was great. Poland has allowed 3.5 million Ukrainians in. That's extraordinary. And I don't see a big movement to get psychiatrists in there to deal with them. You know, it, it's a human problem. And to some extent, Psychiatry, in my opinion, is not entirely human. I know that's a big statement, and any psychiatrist listening to this is going to stop listening at this point. But I do wonder why people, I guess you can be, go into psychiatry because you want to help. I understand that. But I think once you see what they're doing, you have to quit. And there are some. I do get mail from time to time of a therapist, an analyst, a psychiatrist who thought about it deeply, read my books, read other things, and decided this is not for me. So it does happen, but it's rare. And and so, Jeff, I wondered, you know, you said there hasn't been that much change, you know, in terms of our humane response to kind of distress and, you know, and, and feeling so low. So I, I wondered if you had any thoughts about why that change hasn't happened, what's preventing it, what's preventing psychiatry from being more humane, do you think? That's a very, very good question. I have thought about this a lot. Um, I'm 81 years old, so uh, having written 31 books, I think enough. But I would like one last book, and it would be called What's Wrong with Our Species? So, I mean, I've written a lot of books about animals, um, animal emotions that fascinates me, and no animal has ever done anything remotely resembling what humans do to one another. They just don't do it. So that gives me a clue that something has gone wrong with us. Um, and I think that any psychiatrist who is willing to listen to what the, the patient, the movement of patients who've been harmed and really take it in would have to ask himself or herself, what have we done wrong? What's wrong? And very, very, very few have done this. So I think what's stopping it is partly greed. You're, I mean, they do make a lot of money, psychiatrists. <laughs> uh, and even, you know, when they prescribe drugs, they, they do even better because you can do that in a few minutes. You can see 10 patients in an hour. It's not unusual. I've Met psychiatrists told me, yeah, it's, it's great drugs. I just give them a new prescription. It takes me two or three minutes. I can see 20 patients in one hour, $200 a pop. That's a lot of money. You know, when you're making half a million or a million dollars a year from what you do, it's very hard to convince someone this isn't the right thing to do. 
<laughs> Find another profession. What I found difficult, you can't even convince them to read about something. The most profound book I ever read against psychiatry is called Too Much Anger, Too, Ma Too Much Tears by Janet Gottkin. Um, and she was at 17, was put in a psychiatric hospital in New York and given without any kind of anesthesia or painkiller, 120 shock treatments. That she came out of it, able to write this book, is to me a miracle. She's now almost 80, and I correspond with her regularly. And um, she just wants nothing to do with psychiatry anymore after having written that book. But that book, it was, it's profound. And I once gave it to a psychiatrist who I thought of as a friend. I said, please read this. And she gave it back to me. She said, oh, it's not worth it. There's nothing new in it. And I just lost my temper. We never talked again. And so they're not willing to take in criticism of their field. And that bothers me a lot. In other medical fields, I can't imagine that if you told the surgeon, look, what you're doing has now been superseded by a, a better method, you want to learn about it, they, they'd say, sure. But something about psychiatry makes the people who practice it tend towards arrogance. I know how the mind works. No, you don't. Nobody knows how the mind works. Nobody. And so, Jeff, I'm very interested in your thoughts on, you know, what it was that kind of um, interested you in, in, in animal philosophy and, you know, the, the philosophy of how we, we treat animals. And, you know, you said that, um, you know, animals don't treat each other the way that we humans treat each other as a species. But, of course, we treat animals very badly. And I wondered if you thought there were some parallels there between how we treat it, we treated each other, perhaps in, in the experiences you write about in your paper and the mass slaughter of animals and, you know, what, what we do and how we take advantage of the creatures of this planet. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you just put it in a nutshell. You're, you're right. <laughs> I just have to repeat that question with, without making it a question and you've got my views. <laughs> I think we agree on that. Uh, absolutely. I mean, you know, there have been any number of uh, Holocaust survivors who have um, compared the Holocaust experience to the way we treat animals today. And, and people get absolutely crazed about this. They, they hate to see that. But the truth is, it is similar. Um, and I, you know, I've often asked myself, I'm sure you have too, how could these people have done that to innocent children? You know, how do you take a little five-year-old, six-year-old, and, and send them to a gas chamber. How is it possible? But, um, and, and nobody knows, you know, you, you drive yourself crazy, as, as Primo Levi stated, and Jean Améry stated, you just can't think about it. If you think about it too long, you go, you go partly insane. It's just unbearable. And yet, we do very similar things to animals. Um, I was reading something yesterday, a very, very interesting book that the author sent me. It's by a psychoanalyst who was the victim of incest. And he writes about it very, very honestly. And he writes against his profession of psychoanalysis. That's, I guess, why he sent it to me. And he talks about um, how he was... Uh, very badly sexually abused as a very young boy. And he heard screaming, which was his own screaming. And he said, only later in life did I hear the same scream. It came from a pig who was being slaughtered. And I thought, wow, I know not from direct experience, thank God, but I've read that many times that when pigs are slaughtered, they sound like children being hurt. They scream. And it, it's, it's just like a human. And I thought, how do people do this? You know, how does somebody cut the throat of a pig and, and listen to this? And of course, we do it, you know, six billion times a year to animals. Uh, I do, but that, that too is changing. I went for a long bike ride with my son uh, through Berlin last night, 
and we came to one street where there were five vegan restaurants on one street. <laughs> Must be the only place in the world. And I, I do believe, you know, if you look at what happens to animals, they get taken in these trains, you know, staring out. And as soon as they reach the destination, their throats are cut. And all this for what? To ruin the planet, to make ourselves physically sick. So I'm a vegan. I've been vegan for 18 years now. Uh, for me, it definitely was having to do with my understanding of the Holocaust, that I saw the parallels there. And I thought, I just don't want anything to do with this. Yeah, that's important. Thank you. And, and Jeff, you know, people listening to this will be fascinated and want to know more about you and your work. So you've got so many books. Is there one of your books that you'd recommend that people could read that's a good general introduction to you and your ideas, do you think? I think my best book, apart from The Assault on Truth, is called Beasts, What Animals Can Teach Us About the Origins of Good and Evil. Because there I address this question that you, James, asked me um, about animals not being vicious in the way that humans are. And I go into great detail about this. Even sharks and uh, killer whales and crocodiles, they don't do what we do. Uh, you know, they don't hunt for pleasure the way humans do. So I wanted to understand that. And it's the beginning of this book, What's Wrong With Our Species, which I'm not able to write because I don't have an answer yet. There is something wrong, <laughs> but I haven't found it. And, you know, as you can see, it hasn't gotten me down. I'm, I'm a very happy person. I'm very lucky, married to this extraordinary woman. I, I'm writing for her children a book called The World According to Lila. That's her name, Lila. And she is most unusual person I've ever met in, in the best sense of the word. <laughs> Jeff, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your time today. It's been fascinating to hear about what led to your work with John to write this paper. You know, the, the paper, I recommend that listeners read it. It's, um, it's, it is a challenging read, but it's so very important to understand what happened at that particular time, how psychiatry did or didn't react to it, and how some people then went on to find a way out of the trauma that they, they'd experienced while they were kind of involved in some really, really horrific things. So thank you so much for your work on that and and you know for spending some time with me to, to just touch on a tiny part of your fascinating life jeff thank you so much well and thank you james i i can't remember having somebody ask as such interesting questions as you do you're a wonderful interviewer oh thank you jeff well i just want to thank john and jeffrey for taking the time to chat for the podcast their paper is very important reading, not just for the history that shouldn't be forgotten, but also for the call to hasten a shift toward a humane, trauma-informed paradigm of care. So thank you for listening, and until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views, and updates.